Hi there, Perro. In this video here, terms in the will conversation, just at the end, you're talking about animals and you're really drawing out the difference between having self-reflexive consciousness or having consciousness and having a, a self-reflexive consciousness that's capable of reporting on its own conditions, which you identify probably correctly with the human condition. Other primates and other animals have got... Um, a certain amount of self-reflexive consciousness as we know they can recognize themselves in mirrors and so on but they can't report on that condition because they don't have the language structures to do that and other animals you know from very different uh, in very different species don't have the don't seem to have that kind of self-reflexive consciousness at all they can't recognize themselves in mirrors and so on but they're undoubtedly conscious the lights are on there's just there's just not a mirror held up to the world that they can see themselves uh, in even if they they're not capable of recognising that they're doing that. They don't have um, the remembered present. They don't have the specious present, as William James calls it. They're, they have some kind of different relationship to it. Um, but I do think the human condition is very specific. Because it's... it's you know, I, don't, I don't know what the origins of will and choice are. I mean, if you look at someone like um, Rodolfo Linas, who talks about motricity and about the origins of thinking in the sensory motor system... I mean, what he's saying there, I think his, his famous catchphrase is that all thinking is internalised movement or internalised motion, that, uh, that our capacity to think maps out of our capacity to move and to, um, for our even quite primitive organisms, as long as they've got some kind of central nervous system capable of, of holding information and remembering and using that information later on, you know, in, that, in the kind of stored way that programmes do. Uh, as long as you've got that basic infrastructure, um, simple organisms do this thing which looks like making choices. They can, they're confronted, as, <laughs> it's so hard not to use willful language in this, and I'll, just, I'll just use it. Uh, when they're confronted by alternative pathways, they, the, the computation which drives them down one pathway or another maps onto their capacity to actually do that movement. You know, the things that are sessile, animals or, or plants that don't move, don't need to develop the kind of cognition, the kind of um, information processing, which weighs alternatives up because they have no they have no means of making use of that information. Whereas, of course, animals that are motile do. So where am I going with this? Okay, so the original, so the additional thing that we've got on top of that, which I think kind of leads into this language thing, is that we are capable not only of representing ourselves, we don't, we don't also do this thing that animals do constantly, even really simple animals, of finding themselves at a, at a fork in the road, which is really a kind of connectionist, a point in the connectionist network in which the weightings haven't been quite worked out yet. It's not, we don't just do that, we're also capable of representing the fork in the road and representing ourselves and imagining... Uh, imagining ourselves taking alternative routes in, in quite complex detail and representing that linguistically and, and, that, and that it, a lot of the capacity to do that and the, the kind of um, artefacts that language throw up particularly the metaphorical language that's thrown up by that and I know you're interested in, uh, in Lakoff and Johnson's stuff Piro, and I think a lot of this comes out of that um, is what I think produces at least some of these will ideas. You know, here we are, where where we're the little organisms, constantly caught at the at at, at forks in the road, or at um, at the point where the where the river is constantly dividing at the delta, and um, and our connectionist networks are firing, information is being processed. And alongside of that, representations of this, of this information is being processed and presented to us in the, well, I think you've called the Cartesian theatre of the mind, and, um, and, and represented linguistically as a set of choices. And we can talk about these things. They're not, I'm not, choice doesn't capture what's happening there. Will doesn't capture what's happening there. These are artefacts of the, of the, the, of the set of metaphors that we're deploying to interpret this situation and to describe ourselves in this situation and describe the situation to one another because that seems to be part of what our information processing system is doing um, but but to say that that's real I see real is such a poor word here but to, 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 to lean on the artefacts of our language to lean on the metaphors that our language is producing particularly something like will which is deeply embedded within sets of metaphors to do with force 
and, and really all metaphors to do with force for the most part. Um, Leonard Talmy is the man on this one, by the way. He writes about metaphors of force really well in this. But um, to, 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 to go there with the language and, and assume that because we have these feelings, because the, and the, because the phenomenology is telling us that we're having this, that therefore that's the... Um, you know that that's the thing to be described. I mean, it can be described. It's a it's a good experiment, and, in, and it, it's a good set of ideas in phenomenology, or in cognitive uh, cognitive linguistics, or any of those kind of areas. It's just not a good. It's just not a good way of describing the physics of the world, in my opinion. The physics of the world is doing something very different to what our minds and brains and language is doing, and they don't. I don't think they map onto one another any any anything like a good way. Um, I don't think that's very coherent. But anyway, just to just to close, I mean, I think what you're saying there about animals is really revealing. You know, I don't think animals experience the feeling of will. At least most animals don't. Only animals that have uh, a certain kind of consciousness uh, experience will, I would say, and only the ones that are capable of putting it into language form, i.e., ourselves, experience it in the way that we do. And, um, and the way that we do is because of the, the baggage of our linguistic history and the baggage of our embodied history, I would say.